What is electrofishing? Why is it important? And do we have any fish in Sligo? Electrofishing is an important means of collecting data about fish populations in our creeks and streams. By collecting data annually over many years, we can determine the biological trends of the creek. The trends show if we are succeeding in our efforts to preserve and protect streams like Sligo Creek. The trends are also important factors in considering land management and urban planning decisions. So these surveys are very important. Trained professionals oversee the electrofishing surveys along Sligo Creek. Electrofishing is a safe method that allows the Park Planning and Stewardship Division biologists to obtain a more complete picture of the Sligo Creek aquatic community. Simply stated, electrofishing surveys work by using an electric current to stun fish which are then scooped up with nets and placed into holding buckets with aerating units. Biologists then collect data about the collected fish. Before the survey starts, a fine stop net barrier is installed at the beginning and end of the survey site. The barrier is used to keep fish from entering or leaving the survey site during the survey, which could result in a misrepresentation of the fish population present. During Sligo Creek's fish survey, a survey team forms a line of individuals who slowly and methodically walk up a 75-meter segment of creek. The survey team line includes individuals with electrofishing backpacks and individuals that are tasked with collecting the stung fish. The battery-powered electrofishing backpacks are used to generate current in the water which stuns the fish who are then collected and placed in buckets. Two passes are made to collect as many fish as possible. Once a pass is made over the designated 75 meter segment of the creek, or what the park's biologists call a station, the biologists begin collecting data. The data collected includes total biomass of fish collected, fish species collected, and the number of each species collected. The biologist calls out fish species so it can be recorded on a chart by a member of the team. The results are very interesting. Here the biologists are counting the number of American eels that were collected. <laughs> the eels are known escape artists that are maintained separately from the rest of the fish sample. The eels will remain in this gray live well which is placed in an area where water flows through it until they can be released back into the creek at the end of the second electrofishing pass. At least 27 American eels live in the 75 meter creek segment. So that would suggest that there is enough small fish to support them. Does the shocking harm the fish? Usually no. After the necessary data is collected, most of the fish are returned to the creek unharmed. You can see he's going to be a strong fish, so I'll hang on to him as long as I can. But as a sucker, or in the family of fish known as suckers, they have those downward turned mouths that are pretty much on the bottom, so that's how they feed, right? They're going to go kind of along the bottom, sucking up invertebrates, sucking up um, herbaceous material um, and other organic material. We recognize this guy by these saddles or banding pattern you can see along the top. And when you look at them, almost like you're sighting down the scope of something, they're going to have a concave head or a concave area between their eyes. I'm give him a little break and I'll pull out his 
other family member, the oh, white sucker. So you can see a difference in those head profiles right away, right? Again, concave versus convex okay. there. And then the mouth profile is a little different, a little bit more snorkel-like down there, and then that guy. But as suckers, both going to have those nice fleshy lips along the bottom. But for even though they're in the same family, we do see different um, pollution and habitat tolerances within them. So our white sucker here tends to be a little more tolerant. It's considered pollution tolerant. It's a little bit more of a generalist species for um, habitat preferences and what they eat and so on and so forth. And then our northern hog sucker here um, prefers the nice uh, oxygenated riffle habitat and eating aquatic invertebrates primarily. So certainly other little organic material in the bottom he'll be happy to set up and work on as well. So yeah, pollution intolerant and tolerant. That's probably enough, huh? I don't want to impede. Uh, Unless there's something... I can, yeah, I can do a couple more species yeah. profiles okay. for you. This is a really nice sized yeah. long nose dace. So these guys are known, I was explaining earlier, as a riffle invertivore. So invertivore being they like to eat invertebrates, so aquatic insects. And then riffles, again, that habitat, uh, the breaks over the rocks, creates little cascades, really highly oxygenated water, kind of like little mini whitewater rapids. And so they stay in those high areas of flow um, and preferentially eating the aquatic invertebrates that are there. And so this is quite a decent sized one uh, as far as long nose days go. You can see they get their name by flipping over how much his nose overhangs his mouth and how far down positioned his mouth is. And the nose is very fleshy. It's very cartilaginous, just like our nose. Okay. One of our pretty native sunfish. This is a, one of our native sunfish. So some have been introduced. This one is the red breast sunfish. So as the name suggests, oops, <laughs> feeling shy. Yeah, as the name suggests, very orange chest um, to midpoint of the underside there. Um, when we're looking at different kinds of sunfish, we'll look at this area here known as the apercal flap. Um, and what its shape looks like. So in this case, kind of elongated, it's black all the way to the margin. And we'll look at some of the kind of patterning and coloration too. So you'll see also like on the red the breast, eye. these nice striations. That's, that's normal, huh? Yeah, that's just a nice, pretty appearance that they have. Ooh, yeah. um, our green sunfish, which is another native, more tolerant sunfish, also has a little bit of that, but um, kind of in a different arrangement and yeah. a little bit thinner. See, I think I put two in, yeah, so. Ooh, he is very short. Here's a slightly bigger one, but you can see some of the same features and even more elongate or purple flap on this particular red breast sunfish. Bluegill sunfish. Is it bluegill sunfish? Yep. So just as we were talking about some of the features we look at, the purple flap is much smaller on these guys, both because he's a smaller sunfish, but by nature of this species, theirs doesn't get elongated like you saw on the red breast sunfish. And then they are dark here to the edge as well. So we look for that. And a useful telltale for bluegills is for whatever reason, they get this concentration of pigment in the soft part of their dorsal. Yeah, we call it a thumbprint spot, like someone had like newspaper print ink cans and went whoop, right there. So we always check that on our sunfish. Uh, they have a, a full grown adult. No. So we've got another little benthic dwelling invertivore. So another aquatic insect eater. You can see how. What's it called? Uh, this is the tessellated darter. Tessellated Sorry. Darter. Yep. So we look for in these patterns. So these kind of XW marks and the tessellations in the tail. What is tessellation? Uh, it's just kind of that patterning. I don't want to call it, it's not checkerboard, but it's along the same vein the, as a checkerboard the, the, the pattern. Dark, uh, evenly spaced. Yeah. That's tessellation. Yeah, tessellation there and like kind of through the tail here, that kind of every other wavy pattern. Huh.